same part. The same how we come to the payoff. Yeah, see the snooky fucking wannabe look and the yeah, I don't like Hey! How you doing? Welcome to the Richie Antipuna Show. This is our rewind segment. We're, we're going to be taking you back in season one with all the, uh, we're going to rewind, you know, all the shows and give you the best of the original, you know, the first season. So, uh, we want you to sit back, relax, enjoy this. We got episode two coming out next week. Uh, this one's entitled Kenzo News. The episode next week will have another title, but it, we'll have the second Rewind show coming out then. And uh, So sit back, relax, and enjoy the Rewind shows until we get in our new studio uh, coming in October. We'll be in a new studio, and we'll have season two being shot. So sit back, relax, watch the show, and thanks for watching. Thanks for your support. Hi, I'm here with Frankie, and we were just getting his opinion on the couple that took their son down to rob a jewelry store but left them behind. What do you think about that story? Uh, I think that you got to be some kind of a coward to take your son to rob a jewelry store first off, and you're putting his safety in jeopardy, and then to leave him behind on top of that, it just doesn't make no sense, you know? I mean, you just, just got to be a man. I mean, on top of that, you, what kind of example are you showing your, your kid, you know what I mean, growing up to, to rob a jewelry store? It just doesn't make, make no sense to me. Within a week's time, these are some of the things that happened over the, the past week. Um, there was and a and robbery. Around, and then around Kensington and Somerset. Same area, okay. yeah. There was a robbery on the 2700 block of Kensington Ave at 7 a.m. Uh, with a knife. On um, 2000 block of Sterner Street on the 6th, there was a, a vehicle stolen around 4 p.m., hmm. which is common. Uh, someone was robbed at gunpoint at the 3100 block of Kensington Avenue. And that was like right at 3, 3.30 in the afternoon. Wow. So that's pretty brazen of the person to do that. And uh, this one, which I was pretty shocked to hear, there was another rape at the 18, 1800 block of Hart Lane. Oh, that's right where Elaine Goldberg was raped and killed. In that, right there. Right there on, on that same block. On, is it on the same block? Same and block. that was early in the morning. So, you know, and I don't remember hearing anything on the news about that. No. So that's pretty scary that somebody else is doing the same thing in that same area. Hmm. And on the 1800 block of Somerset, um, someone had their purse snatched, which I'm sure is a everyday occasion. At Frankfurt and Lehigh, someone was robbed at gunpoint also at 7.30 in the morning. Like these people walk around early in the morning and well, that's rob when, people. That's when the, the heroin addicts go get their dope. Oh, is it? Yeah. Okay. And uh, the 2800 block of Helen Street, someone was robbed at uh, 9.30 a.m. So it seems like there's more All crime in the, in the morning. morning than there is at nighttime, yeah. which is weird. So be careful out there, people. You never know, you know, what could happen. Uh, the guy's stupid because if he's gonna do a crime scene, he might as well not leave no clues behind. Like, become a little more, bit more professional at it, I would say. Anybody could have thought of a better thing to do than leave their kids behind. That's a huge clue. So your advice is don't take the kids to work if you're a jewelry thief. Yeah. It was reported on Philly.com that Greg Butcheroni, coordinator of the Youth Violence and Crime Reduction Partnership, said that his organization regularly does neighborhood cleanups and that the next one is in the planning stages and will likely happen next month, possibly at Kensington and Somerset. Yeah. As he said to us that he, you know, he would do that. I would like to see that. We're in, Butch. With us now is Greg Butcheroni. Can you come over here, Greg, please? And uh, can you explain who this man is here and what he does for you guys and that he has had a background check and why his civil rights were taken away from him because he was practically demanding? And I know the things that are going on and it's a tough time out here with the strangle and everything, but civil rights cannot be um, violated because of that. So can you tell us uh, what he does for your group and how long he's been with you guys and has he had a, a thorough background check and explain to that to the viewing audience? Sure. All right, Manuel Sanchez, aka Chino, he's been with us. He's my brother-in-law. He's been volunteering on again, off again for several years with us, working, advocating for victims, translating in Spanish for the victims that don't speak English. Uh, he's, you know, out there struggling. He's getting his GED. He's doing positive rap music. He comes out with us. He's been with us since day one, since the first homicide down in Jasper and Cumberland. And he goes out 
comes with us at the press conference that we were invited to by the mayor and the police commissioner. He comes out, he's there, he's standing with me and other activists. The minute he leaves, the press conference is over, he leaves, they wind up waiting for him to get away from me and go out there and use what's called vigilante justice on them damn selves, coming out here stopping this guy, waiting for him and, and, and throwing him a good wall with their hands on the guns and threatening to throw him in jail if he don't cooperate. And then he tells them he's out there helping the police, helping the victims, and he's been there from day one. He's got background checks, uh, child abuse clearances. He's been out there, he's been the homicide where we escorted victims to special victims or, or, or possible witnesses to homicide. And this is how the Philadelphia Police Department treats its people who volunteer to be helpful to the police. And I think there was some punk ass fucking shit. If I was there, it would have been some shit. You would have had two press conferences one, the press conference with the mayor. Another one, some fucking dirty ass bastard cops getting the fucking ass kicked because nobody comes up to my team. And the police department should know that fucking shit from 2003 where they beat the hell out of my brother while he was handcuffed. Don't fuck with my team. If you're going to fuck, you don't want to return my phone call, Mr. Mayor, uh, Commissioner, you don't want to return my fucking phone call, that's fine. But don't fuck with my people. He's been out here. This is why the young black males in Kensington and the young Latinos aren't forthcoming and coming forward because they come out to help and the police department talks about don't use vigilante justice, but they're quick to violate a young brother of color's rights and threaten them with jail, incarceration, and have their hands on their guns for doing nothing but being law-abiding citizens. This fucking shit can't be going on. And you know what? You don't want to talk to me because I'm not important enough to fucking call? You can talk to me in front of fucking news cameras in front of the courtroom because this shit ain't going to go undone. Today I talked to at least 25 young, light-skinned males, black and Latino, that fit the general profile of my brother right here, and they told me similar stories where the police department came up, hands on the guns, threw them on the ground, fucking searched the car, searched this, made them, forced them to take swabs, and they didn't cooperate, they were going to throw them in jail for the holidays, and they wouldn't been released until after Christmas. Now, what kind of fucking shit is that, Mayor? If you want to shit in my defecate in fucking Kensington, I'm going to come to your fucking houses, defecate. If this was some black minister group and not young Latino males, this shit, you'd have Al Sharpton down there fucking protesting. If this was white America, upper class white America, you'd have fucking some cracker fabulous motherfucker down here protesting. But it's okay to violate young Latino males in Kensington because you guys don't know what the fuck you're doing. I've been doing crime victim services since the Son of Sam murders. Been doing it. I've seen the NYPT in their frenzies. I did the DC sniper down there in Washington DC. I seen that with people running around not knowing what the fuck to do. And you can't violate people's fucking rights. Anyone's got a fucking problem with me, if it's a city official, they got my fucking number because you best I'm going to reach out to you motherfuckers. I want to give a special thanks, Ed, especially to the viewers like you. And uh, I want to thank uh, Greg Fabiani, Heather Barton, Dan Schmidt, Mark Brodzik, Carlos Serrano, Jim Davis, John Young, and if I forgot anybody else, you know, if I remembered your name, I would have said it. But uh, I would like to thank everybody. Oh, wait, one very big special thanks goes out to City Commissioner Joe Duda. Without him spending taxpayers' dollars to get me off the ballot, I wouldn't have time to do all this right now. So if you like these shows, write Joseph Duda at the city commissioner's office and let him know. Thanks. I think that it wasn't too bad. His children are innocent. They don't know the rules of the world until an adult teaches them that. So I don't think it's too bad of a thing that he did a good deed. But don't you think you're supposed to be loyal to your parents? I don't know, some of these other fellows who might not be too loyal to anything in the city may agree on that, but I, I stick with what I say. On May 23rd, three guys walked up to a crowd of people in the 2100 block of Orleans Street and started shooting. A 17-year-old boy and his 23-month-old nephew were hit. The baby amazingly only suffered a broken collarbone. Thank God, but the 17-year-old who was shot in the face was seriously injured and remained in critical condition since the shooting. As of last week, we received an update that their condition from a fellow Kenzo, Julie Hurling Doherty, who is the stepmother and grandmother of the victims of the shooting. She said her stepson is doing very well. 
He is off the ventilator and all the brain damage drainage tubes are out of his head now. He has a very long road ahead of him in rehab and he will most likely be going to rehab any day now. And the baby is doing great. He may have nerve damage, but they are, they are still waiting for the bone doctor to read his MRI. Yeah, and we wish them well. There was a meeting held at the Salvation Army in Kensington with internal affairs and the residents. Police decided to hold these meetings because there have been some recent high profile cases, corruption, cases of corruption in the Philly Police Department. We all know that. The meeting was basically to explain to the public how to go about reporting problems with cops and, you know, whatever they hear to internal affairs. Um, but as it turns out, the people at the meeting really didn't want to talk about that. They wanted to know how the cops dealt with shootouts and why they can't remove dead bodies out of the street faster so kids and old people don't see that shit. Captain Venor Jr., the 25th, said, Unfortunately, due to the nature of investigation and forensic work that needs to be done, after a person's been declared deceased, police need to leave the body in place in order to study the crime scene. If there is no sign of life, we have to leave them there, he said. But of course, we don't want to leave them out in the open for children or anyone to see. They also complained about the shootings in the neighborhood. And one lady said that the cops aren't doing enough to keep the gun violence down at Jasper and Somerset. Captain Davidson on the 24th said he would investigate that and have police patrol the area. And then, ironically, an, about a half hour after the meeting, a guy was shot to death by police because he pulled out a gun on, um, on the 2000 block of Birch Street, which is about two blocks away from Jasper and Somerset. Hmm. So I guess she was right. There's a gun problem over there. Here. I don't know, like, the kid, the parents left the kid alone, and they asked him what's his parents' name, and they just, he just said their name. He don't know too much, he's only four years old. But he wasn't loyal. Earlier this month, someone walked into City Hall and stole two stenographer machines. Surveillance showed Rika Hughes, age 38, who was taught, or who was taught, no, he wasn't taught to steal. He was thought oh. to be a woman at first because he looked, if you've seen the picture, he, he looks he like looked a woman. He looked like a woman. Yeah, well, he allegedly walked right into council chambers and took the two machines. Just like walked out, so I don't know how he did that. I don't know without either. you know people. City hall security, you're slipping. Yeah, he had been to the office before to visit Councilman Blackwell about something about being homeless. I'm not too sure what that was about. They didn't really elaborate, but uh, Council's chief accountant officer said he's left the machines with a social worker and just took the cases and was using them for suitcases. Well, yeah, for his belongings. Yeah, that's not a bad idea. It's not really. But he end, they ended up finding them in Love Park with the, the cases. cases and he had his them? clothes in it. I guess they rested them, yeah. I mean, like, they have to, right? Let him so go. Now they're going to, yeah, right? Now they're going to keep them in supply closets locked up so people can't just walk out with them. But hmm. What do you have for us today? Well, uh, I, I talked to you about the uh, police mobile homes and what, what effect they do not have on the neighborhood because they're parked out in front of like recreational centers and stuff like that. And you'll see them parked like close to Dunkin' Donuts and whatnot and shopping centers. Are but there then, people in there? I, I'm not, I don't know, but even if they had an empty one parked at Kensington and Somerset, I think it would do a little bit more than what is not being done out there now. You know what I mean? Well, there was a cop car out there a couple yeah, weeks. Just, well, yeah. I got I got some insight from a from a couple of people that told me that most of the people out on Somerset now are informants for the police. So the people that are out there, eighty percent of them are out there because the police want them out there to be informants. What are they informing them about? That's why they don't. Well, who's moving and shaking? They don't know that already. I guess not. But that's why they're out there, and that's why the police don't really do much, because it's all their informants that are out there. So your goal as, as councilman... Not, I'm not going to be councilman. Or whatever, what is it? Don't have nothing to do with that. Can I we doing. get a petition and get a... No, we could just do that, you know, just do that if we want to, just complain. Like, you got these mobile homes sitting in places where there's nothing happening what, what are they there for i seen a winnebago today on the way down we can buy it and park it there ourselves nah, I'm cool. you can patrol <laughs> the neighborhood uh, you're the man hey you've been watching the richie antipuna show rewind special of season one 
Thanks for watching, and you're watching on Philly Cam Channel 66 in Philadelphia. I'm here with Fred. Fred, what would you do in a situation if your parents asked you to go to work with them one day and they decided to rob a jewelry store? Um, hey, you pinch them so you gotta follow their rules, you know? I'm gonna tag along, man. Just, I ain't gonna turn them up if they get caught, you know, but you gotta listen, do what they do too. I'm not gonna write my parents out. Probably tell a family member or something and try to move in with them, but I'm not gonna do my parents. Back to the Kensington area, Jack's famous on Allegheny Ave. We all know that. It's been there for about a thousand years. Yeah. It's one of the greatest dive bars in the city, if not in the country. You'll find 400 dusty bottles of brown liquor that have been on the wall since just after Prohibition. Mm -hmm. They still have the counterfeit labels on them. Mm -hmm. They've been there for some 70 years and before World War II. Food and drink can be had here for so little. And you wonder how they make a profit at 45 cents for a tub of potato salad and $1.75 for a liverwurst and onion sandwich. The same for a draft pint. I shouldn't have put that in there because now that's where you're going to take me to launch, ain't it? Yeah. Ugh. Every day. Every time. Well, there was a time when the uh, Kensington section of the city was the busiest manufacturing sector in the whole area with their dye mills and their uh, factories and other bustling textile manufacturers gainfully employed thousands. The block of Kensington and Allegheny, or K&A, as it's called by its residents, was a particularly white hot hub. What? A marketplace perpetually teaming with What is a white hot hub? This, I wanted the article read as he wrote because this guy was like putting it down today. If you get to the bottom, you see where in the part where he says downtrot and he, it was, it was an article within the article. Okay. It said in another article in Philadelphia Weekly, those high times are in heady contrast to the stark reality of facing the neighborhood today. I'm only reading what I'm saying. I don't, I don't know what the hell is it. <laughs> One that finds burnout junkies scratching violently at their skin, prostitutes working the track and general shiftiness at every turn. Well, according to the writer of that article, he put Philly dives against the dives in any major American city, and he said, we trounced them. That's so we said. are number one at We're something. Number one, there you go. It cracks me up there that these people come in, like they don't know us, they don't live here, and then they come in and they, they look down the whole outside, city. Right. But the guy that was taking the pictures for this article. He was taking the pictures? Okay, he was taking the fucking pictures, and he said, and he wrote his own article. 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 <laughs> he wrote his own article. Don't try to get all fucking professional. You're fucking it up. Is it 420? <laughs> anyway, he wrote his own article and he said, and I quote. How <laughs> 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 He wrote his own article article and said and I quote how I almost died twice taking pictures of Philadelphia's best bars because a few people came up to him and asked him what he was doing he considers that almost dying well and these he are people from the suburbs that's why so stop trying to come into our neighborhoods acting like you know right and don't take our picture get a long lens or right. wide lens or whatever the fuck it is right hi we're here with Sonia today your front Gerard and we'd like to ask her her opinion on the fact that the president actually gave a phone call to the Eagles organization thanking them for giving Michael Vick a second chance what's your opinion on that I think he went a little overboard um, I don't think he needs to be thanked for uh, coming back onto the Eagles they should really not even put him back on the team because what he did to those dogs was you know, a disgrace um, I love animals and anybody that tortures animals, now I hear he wants to get a dog for his kids. Does, he doesn't deserve to get a dog. That's my opinion. Bob Coyle had uh, 300 homes in Kensington, defaulted on all the mortgages. I did hear something about that, yeah. Promised to have these uh, poor people, uh, you know, thinking they're going to own the homes and uh, they all, they're all facing foreclosure and they're getting ready to lose their homes. And, yeah, he basically borrowed like fifteen million dollars or something, and bought all these homes. How he could get that many homes, three hundred homes in Kensington, is beyond me. Especially well, when we were told last week he can't even get the sheriff sale. Yeah, well, that's why they dubbed him the Slumlord Millionaire. And all his houses that he has are, you know, 
boarded up vacant abandoned lots. Well, no, a lot of people live in them because the one woman, she actually has seven grandchildren and she's getting thrown out. She, well, she's afraid she's going to get thrown out. They're holding hearings in April. This reminds me back in the day with John Cott. He was another one who owned over 200 houses in Kansas and he went to jail for manufacturing methamphetamine and, and all those houses went up, you know. People got thrown out, they all got taken. Well, obviously this guy was up to something else and he, yeah. he probably has another business of some sort. You know. uh, well, most of his, uh, the blocks his house is on, they look like war zones, you know. I, he just, he used poor people to get rich. He said, fuck the houses, he took the money. Well, in a recent article in the city paper titled The Wasteland, which they're referring to Kensington. That's not nice. It was written by Isaiah Thompson and Anthony Campisi. It refers to the railroad tracks where the bodies of Casey Mahoney was found. And one resident says ambulance arrived daily to retrieve the living or dead bodies of people who have overdosed. And I've actually been down there, shot a video, and there's like thousands and thousands of fucking used needles down there. Oh, I thought you were going to say thousands of bodies. Oh, no, no, no. And uh, uh, Well, they say the sounds of beatings and sometimes pleas for help wake residents up at night. Which I said anyway, like, uh, I, I, I told everybody when all that Kensington Stranger stuff was going on, if you have any bitches or complaints, do it now, because Kensington was on worldwide news. Like, that's, yeah. it'll never be on the news again unless something like that happens anyway. And uh, Conrail says, talk to the city. The city says, talk to Conrail. The cops say, don't worry about it, it's under control. Residents went to the congressman, Bob Brady, and were suggested to do nothing. Brady's spokeswoman says no one in the congressman's office has heard anything about the viaduct, despite the fact that residents and neighborhood groups insist they contact the Brady's office. Police officials, while acknowledging the problem, say their resources are stretched to the max. That property is really Conrail property. Asked whether the police could simply provide a heavy permanent presence by the tracks, something like the South Street Police Detail, 24th Police Captain of the district, Thomas Davison, paused for answering, I hadn't thought of that. It's an idea. Conrail claims they have the railroads policed. What these groups want most is for Conrail to commit to cleaning and refencing the tracks, at least the most crime-ridden parts of them. In return, they'll take responsibility for recruiting volunteers and or paid staff to help ma maintain the area. Hey, you've been watching the Richie Antipuna Rewind episode of season one. This is entitled Kenzo News because we're bringing you all the highlights of the Kenzo News segments during our show. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the rest of the show. Outside the fencing and to make sure the fences stay closed. Found a Kensington man, John James, not guilty of aggravated assault. Good job, Jay. Uh, possession of an instrument of crime and simple assault. He was accused of using a motorcycle to try to run over a police officer. However, the jury did find him guilty of recklessly endangering another person and fleeing an officer. Although James was the one on trial, his defense attorneys tried to put Sergeant Richard D. Coatsworth's credibility on the line during the trial. A forensic pathologist and three eyewitnesses testified that he shot James in the leg from behind while he rode a motorcycle. The Coatsworth testified that he shot in self-defense from the side as James, then 18, aimed his speeding bike directly at him. Police had been chasing the owner of the bike who got off and allowed James to get on minutes later. That's because he can ride a bike That's fast. mean. He like, can ride a bike I'm fast. being chased by the cops. Here, you can ride it. He's a, he, he's a fast rider. You can, he's good. You can ride my he's bike good, now. And, and we're going to show footage of him. Good idea. Maybe I'll run from the cops in my car and then let you borrow Minutes it. later, the coach rev shot him and fired a second bullet into the gas tank. At the time of the incident, the coach rev was being investigated for shooting someone else in 09, but was cleared. Some praise him as a hero for surviving a shotgun blast to the mouth as a rookie but others disagree. The sergeant has had nine citizen complaints accusing assault, abuse, and misconduct. One, according to sources, he became enraged at an employee at a dry cleaners and shoved a 63-year-old man to the floor, causing him to hit his head. Last year, his actions cost the city money. 
A Columbia University education professor and now a Daily News columnist received an out-of-court settlement after he filed a federal lawsuit accusing the Coatsworth of violating his Fourth Amendment rights by illegally searching him and his car. Very much. I think it's wonderful. I mean, when the man did his time, he accomplished everything that he was supposed to, and he really brought the team up, and I think that's wonderful. And I think his spirit is what caused the team to have their spirit because everybody deserves a second chance, everybody. And I think he's learned a lot from it. Well, we, uh, we, we went down there and cleaned the beach street down there and, uh, you know, by the river there. You were there, weren't you? I was there. Yeah, I was working very hard, as was everyone else. You were working hard? Very hard. I seen you sitting in the truck a lot. No, that wasn't me. No. That okay. was my stunt double. Well, we had about 35, 40 people come out. With and all with hangovers and everything else. Yeah. So we they made it out that. on Saturday Thank morning. You. Thank you for coming out. Absolutely. And we found no dead animals or dead bodies or anything in the trash. No there. limbs, no. Just we found a toilet. Did, oh yeah. Yeah, we found a toilet. Well, we'd like to thank Tom Potts and the new you know, from New, new Kensington. Kensington. Yeah, he came out, gave us the supplies and took the trash away and also that was a great union there with the Kensington Pride Foundation in New Kensington. Yeah, and next week we're going to have everybody come up and clean my house. All right. Yeah. Welcome. Well, actually, I think it was a great opinion. Um, I really, me personally, I'm glad that they did because everybody deserves a second sure. chance. And um, I think it was a great thing. And very much his trouble matured him a hell of a lot. So I think that was a great choice that the president made. Now we're going to the Super Bowl. On accessphilly.com, there was a story about a piece of land at Emerald and Dolphin in the East Kensington neighborhood. This parcel of land, if sold, will be developed into a townhouse. That alone is not the problem. The issue is that this land is located smack dab in the middle of a community park and green space. Developing this parcel will destroy the best use for this land, which is a public park that serves and beautifies and unites the community. The plan for EKNA, which is the... Kenston, what is that? The, um, I don't know, you wrote it. You know what it is, because you, that's it, okay. To buy the lot from the private seller, so far they have raised a little over 17000 to purchase it, but they need about 15000 more to close the deal. I think you should get a second chance. I don't see why not. Well, he did get a second chance. He called, he called them thanking them. Okay, well, that's a great thing. And he also, um, I think he's doing the right thing. And I heard the other day talking about having a dog. Yeah, why not? You know, I mean, now he went through the experience and he know what you gotta do if he do get another dog. I think it's a great thing. First Friday is supposed to be a great Philadelphia tradition, but a lot of the artists have been getting harassed by local business owners. Even artists who were setting up in front of abandoned buildings were not safe from license inspectors and police. So they packed up their shit and made an exodus to Frankfurt Ave. They were welcomed by local businesses and the people. They could set up their stuff wherever they wanted. There was free parking, and now all they need is more people. So they say on their Facebook page, let's make this tradition stick. Come out and show your art. Artists, sculpture, photography, music, print and making, silk screening, performance art, whatever you do, get out there and Lollipop licking, whatever art you have. Back shaving. Uh, I think you did a good thing, man. Everybody deserves a second chance, you know? I don't know anybody out here that hasn't made a mistake some kind of another, but mm -hmm. you know, the only thing we can do is rebuild our reputations and ourselves and change the way we live. And I think that's what the man did. So we were Frankie, and we're going to ask Frankie the same question about his opinion on the president calling the Eagles administration and thanking them for giving Michael Vick a second chance and bringing him back to the team. Um, I think it's great. I think Vick did a good job. I think the Eagles are doing a good job, and I think he's going to take us to the Super Bowl and we're going to make a movie after Michael Vick. Go Eagles! Holla! All right, hold on. Wait a minute. <laughs> what's the what's the catch of the day today? The catch. <laughs> That's their solution. Yeah, well, it's in just two a, hours. It would have been better if they could have did it in two weeks. Right. They're just trying to make it look like, oh, this is why it wasn't our fault. Push it off. We know else. the fucking. We know the real deal. It happened in Kensington. Who gives a fuck, right? Right. That's what they say. Hey, thanks for watching the Rich Antipuna Rewind Show. I would like you to all go to Facebook Kenzo Pride Group and join. Join in. You can, you know, see real Kenzos doing their thing. 
And also, you can watch shows at RichieAntipuna.com. That's the official website for the Richie Antipuna Show. Also have a Facebook page for the Richie Antipuna Show. So, thank you for watching. Tune in next week. We'll have another Rewind Show up for you. See you in October with Season 2. Gonna be great. Kenzo Pride forever, baby. Rock on, ignite my song, bring my posse along to the party, cause danger zone, from the heart is in effect, so I say buddy, study, think and learn, dig the move we made, stunning those who just can't behave, discipline, there's a hand, it flow from the damn hand too, tough. All up in you with the formula coming from me Cause no one told ya Of a logo of serious saying This ain't no joke, Jimmy I ain't 